What's going on, Packer fans? Welcome into an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. I'm joined once again by the one and only Paul Brettel of Packers Wire. You can find him on Twitter at Paul underscore Brettel or X, whatever we're calling it these days. Paul, great to have you back. How the heck have you been? I'm excellent, Andy. You know, as we have these conversations weekly, the way this season's gone, I literally never know what we're going to be talking about or what the tone of the conversation is going to be like because it has been an absolute roller coaster this season. It has been as advertised going into the year. We knew there would be highs. We knew there would be lows. We knew there would be frustrations and excitements. And it has just hit every key of that at the absolute extreme ends of the spectrum in ways that I cannot recall any other team in my lifetime hitting those levels of the extreme. It, and I know that Detroit and Kansas City have gone through a little bit of stuff since Green Bay played them, but Kansas City still a really good football team. That is a primetime game, Sunday night football, Taylor Swift at Lambeau Field, snowball game, and that had a big fight feel to it. And Green Bay came out on top in a big fight game. And then, and then they lose two straight to the New York Giants with Tommy DeVito, the Baker Mayfield led Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And it's just, and it's been all year like this, that opening game. And I know it feels like forever ago, but that Chicago Bears opening game, I was like, okay, yes, this team is going to be able to play right out the gate. And then mm-hmm. you open those first three quarters against the Falcons. And you're like, this is awesome. Like this team's going to be so much better than we thought. And then the fourth quarter against the Falcons. And then you get three quarters against the Saints. We're like, this is one of the worst football teams I've ever seen. And then the fourth quarter comes and you're like, they're great again. And it's just been that way. And you have no idea in any moment of any quarter of any game, which version of this team is going to show up. And I have more gray hair, I think, because of it. So, yes, it's been a ride. You know, the the highs seem higher than normal because coming into the season, there's not really expectations because we don't know what to expect. But then you see week one, you know, you see the last five weeks prior to these last two games, and you're like, wow, this is, at least from an offensive perspective, like this is what this team can be. And then that starts to set expectations. And then once you have those expectations – and then you run into games like the last two weeks on the, on the low end. It just makes those lows feel even lower. And it's just like the hard part, too, is even, you know, commenting on any of it, because just when you start feeling some semblance of like, I think I know what this team is now. I think I have. I've got this. This I know exactly what. Nope. You have no idea. You have no idea. They could run off like five straight, three straight, get in the playoffs, win two playoff games. We have no shock. They could lose to the Panthers. I'm sure mm-hmm. that even makes sense at this point. Um, obviously that has been the overarching theme through the course of this season. And so it's, it's not surprising when you get any sort of result in any game, this was a little bit more, you know, this was different in the fact that the defense hadn't looked this bad for an entirety of a game where the other team was able to put up that many points. Green Bay just was not able to get stops. I'm sure that was obviously the key takeaway from everything, but what were kind of your overarching thoughts on Packers box? Yeah, obviously the defensive performance and then coming into the game, the the red zone aspect of it for the Packers offense, like that was going to be a challenge and a huge, huge aspect of this game ended up being obviously red zone always important, but ended up being an even more important factor considering the defense couldn't get any stops, but they had five trips to the red zone against the Tampa Bay Bucks, And that's that played out how it has for the Bucks opponents all season. The Bucks entered the game, allowing the ninth most red zone attempts per game but they ranked fourth in red zone success rate among defenses. And that's what the Packers ran into. And they even had those struggles against the Giants. I mean, they've had 10 red zone trips in the last two games. That's a lot, five per game. But throughout the course of the season, not just these last two weeks, it's been an area where even when this offense has seen their improvements, it's been an area that they've that they've still struggled in. And so for me, that was one of the big aspects of this that stood out. And then, of course, the the defensive side of things. And you know, taking a 30,000 foot view of kind of just where things stand right now, I have two, two thoughts on Joe Barry, this defense. And the first goes into just wondering from the get go, was this hiring doomed to fail? And I don't mean that from the sense of has his past experience or past, you know, endeavors with Washington, with Detroit, any of that, but when we look at what the issues are that this team's experiencing defensively, Matt LaFleur mentioned it over and over and over again, miscommunications. There's a lack of adjustments, situational awareness, or a lack of 
situational awareness. And that's not just these last two weeks. It's over this three year period. There's a lack of development among the the players on this team, like who on this team right now defensively is playing better than they were at the start of the season. I think maybe the only one that comes to mind, at least off the top of my head, is Kenny Clark. And he notoriously does that yep. during this time of the year. And so to me, when it's when those same things are happening over and over again to a variety of players versus just one or two that maybe you can pinpoint or have an issues, like that's coaching, that's teaching. And whether the message isn't getting from correctly from Barry to the positional coaches to the players or wherever in that and probably all the above. I mean, when things go as poorly as they did these last two weeks, like it's everyone, it's everything that's contributing to it. And going back to my original point, and I have this is just me pontificating. This is just me spitballing. But Matt LaFleur wanted this specific defense ran. He was going out looking for coordinators saying, all right, here's what we're going to do. And he was trying to find who he thought was the best fit to run it. Joe Barry's experience in this, you know, the Vic Fangio scheme that everyone refers to, it's one year as a linebackers coach with the Rams under Brandon Staley. Like Staley, I believe, did coach under Vic Fangio. So there's that obvious knowledge. But in terms of what this defense is, he had one year as a positional coach getting I don't want to demean it by saying secondhand information, but from where the source is, like that's where Barry is is in the pipeline in terms of getting that information. And now he said, you know, he's being asked to run this scheme, teach this scheme to the players. And again, that's just, I have, I have no basis. Maybe that means maybe what I'm talking about has a small degree. Maybe it's absolutely nothing, but when it keeps coming back to the teaching aspect of it, the relaying of information, the fact that the players do not, you know, can't continually act on what you want them to do in a game, that's a problem. And Quay Walker, when he was talking at his locker on Monday, I think it was Rob Namaski who asked him, you know, why are you guys playing so much zone? And, you know, he talked about how he's just out there to do what's asked of him, you know, and that's what players do. Coach implements the scheme. You go do your role, but you would think from the why aspect of things, you know, there would be this understanding of, all right, here's what we're, why we're doing this against this defense. And so I just wonder how that information within the building on the practice field is being relayed to these guys. Cause if, if when we were at the training camp practices, if we saw that many breakdowns over the summer, we would still be like, whoa, in yeah. year three, this is not good. Now we're in week 15 of the season and it's happening out there. So I just wonder if that, Barry having to step into a defense that in the grand scheme of his coaching career is not something that he spent a ton of time around. If that's a factor in, you know, what we're seeing take place on the football field. The other thing I wanted to say is in regards to Matt LaFleur, you know, obviously he's in charge. He's ultimately at the end of the day responsible for all this. And he chose to bring Joe Barry back for the third season. You know, he said, I need to be more involved on a, you know, throughout the week to make sure the coaches are on the same page, that the the players understand what their communications are. But, you know, when it's the game plan going into the game, Joe Barry is not going rogue on Sundays. He's not presenting something to Matt LaFleur on Friday and then doing something completely different. Like Matt LaFleur is signing off on this. And then as this Buccaneers game is unfolding and you're seeing them, you know, playing pitch and catch, attacking the middle of defense in the same way, you know, uh, Preston Smith, Keyshawn Nixon, both after the game used the word scheme. You know, Nixon said that they schemed us. Preston Smith talked about, you know, questioning the scheme a little bit. Like it felt like the Bucks knew what was coming. And I think we mentioned this on last week's show where whether it's Pat Mahomes or Tommy DeVito, you could, you know what you're going to get from this Packers defense. And it felt like in every situation, Tampa knew, all right, here's where they're probably going to, what they're probably going to do. Here's where they're probably going to be. And then attack that. So if you're Matt LaFleur, and I get it, it is a ton on his plate because he is the offensive play caller. Like when the defense is out on the field, you know, he's partially preparing for that next possession, making adjustments of his own. But throughout the course of the game, you're the head coach. You're the CEO of this operation. You have to step in. You have to step in and say, hey, do something different. Whether you have a specific suggestion or you're just like, hey, do something different. Like that's his role. That's what you know, needs to happen as the head coach. And 
being completely tuned into the defensive side when, again, you're the offensive play caller, like in the course of a game, is that a lot on his plate? Absolutely it is. But that's a situation that he's put himself in, that the Packers find themselves in, and that they need to figure out. You know, he talked about how I got to find solutions, got to find solutions. It's been three years. I don't know what the solutions are at this point. I think Packer fans have an idea, uh, but that did not happen <laughs> on uh, Monday. That's true. <laughs> um, th there's so much that you said that I want to get into. The first thing that you just mentioned is like, how, and I mentioned it very first thing in my post game show as well. The Tampa Bay was two steps ahead all day long. They knew exactly what they were going to get. And I think one of the really underrated things that's hasn't been talked about as much is the lack of disguise from Green Bay's defense. There, uh, there was a play I posted. It, this was not in the, the Tampa game, and I don't think Tampa ran this version of the play, but there's a flood concept that um, both the, the Chiefs and the Lions ran three times against Green Bay and got chunk plays on it every single time. That play works against cover three, specifically the way that Green Bay defends cover three. There was no doubt whatsoever. And in fact, on Mahomes's, uh, yeah, on Mahomes's play, and I think on the second golf one, they checked into the play based on Green Bay's very clear and obvious non-disguise. They're playing cover three. They're rushing five defense. And then the second two plays, the one by um, the Lions and the one by Mahomes, they checked into it. They got it. And all three plays were huge explosive plays because you, me, my mom, my friend, everyone else, they could all tell that it's going to be cover three on that particular play. And there's no disguising it whatsoever. And that's been a huge problem too is – you can you you a can tell what you're going to get so many of these times and even on the times where it's not completely obvious what you're going to get you have a pretty good idea based on what Joe Barry in this defense is called time over time over time again like i said Tampa was all over it it looked like they had a month to prepare for this game and they they knew in every single third and short that exactly what green bay was going to do they ran multiple players into the same zone, had one person sit underneath, pick up a th free seven yards on a third and four, pitch and catch as easy as it gets. That was number one of all of the things that you mentioned. Number two, you mentioned, you know, who's getting better. And that's been the biggest thing for me that I keep coming back to is this is year three now of this Joe Barry defense. And I have not, not only have I not seen improvement through three years, we're starting to see significant signs of decline and feels like a little bit of angst and frustration within the locker room and within the, in the team. There is no, certainly no progress. There's certainly nothing that you can point to and be like, well, the run defense is at least good. Nope. They've gotten like four or five, 200 yard rushing games against them. Well, at least the pass defense. Nope. Baker Mayfield just threw for a billion yards and four touchdowns. Well, at least they're not giving up big play. Nope, they're giving up big plays too. Well, at least time of possession. Nope, time of possession is not great. Well, at least you're getting turnover. Nope, not getting turnovers either. There's nothing that you can point to that this defense does well. Going back all the way to last year, one of the biggest things I talked about is this defense has to find an identity. They have to figure out something that they do well. And it is very clear and obvious to everyone that, what Joe Barry and Matt LaFleur want this identity to be. We are going to keep everything in front of us. We are going to make sure we don't give up big plays. We are going to hit and we're going to tackle and we're going to make them make mistakes throughout the, their drive down the field. And we're going to bend and we're not going to break. And it's not completely out of vogue in the NFL. That's still what a lot of teams do. Unfortunately, not very successfully in that style system so far this year, including Green Bay. But that's been what they've wanted their identity to be. The bigger issue there is that they're not good at that identity. If if they if they were good at that one thing, if they were consistently bend but don't break, and they like you talked about with Tampa Bay's defense, you allowed them to get in the red zone, but they actually stop for field goals and they're allowing, you know, maybe a touchdown and three, four field goals per game. All right, now you're talking 19, 16 points per game, and you're doing pretty darn well. But everything that this defense has done has not gone according to plan, and they still lack that identity. Couple other things. The it, it's funny because it, it was almost like when Matt Lafleur was asked about. Well, it wasn't necessarily a bad play call. It was miscommunication and misalignment by the. That's worse. That is a million percent worse in week fifteen. That is one million percent worse in week fifteen than if you just said, you know what, we should have called a different play. 
If you just like, you know what, you went with something based on what you thought a tendency was of the other team, you called a specific play and they called something different and they beat you, that is going to happen in the NFL. Now, it shouldn't happen for four quarters over and over and over and over again, but it's going to happen. The fact that in week 15 and year three of this defense with a lot of the same veterans on it and a lot of players who have been in this system for a while cannot communicate effectively and cannot get aligned correctly, that is so much worse than just a poor mm-hmm. play call. So that's another thing. Um, and then the other, th- the last thing, and just kind of going back to the offense too, that you mentioned was like the the lack of the red zone offense. When I went through and I graded everything this week, and I'll get into this a little bit more in my grades art or grades podcast at the end of the week here. But one of the thing that really took me by surprise was how good the offensive grades were. Like they were really good in a week where they scored 20 points and seven of those were off of a turnover. And they were not anywhere near as bad as I expected them to be on defense. It was bad, but I expected it to be this just atrocious grade. But there was a lot that went into that. I covered it in the Packer Report article and I'll cover it again this week. But one of the things that really struck me in this game were key situations. You mentioned it on offense in the red zone. They could get down the field, they could drive, they could pick up yardage, but when they needed those red zone scores, when they needed touchdowns, when Jordan Love had Jaden Reed in the corner of the end zone and some other key third downs, they just couldn't finish it off when they needed to. So you'd have all these great plays that led up to it, but then in the end, it would sort of spiral out, which amounts to not great on the score sheet, but in the grade sheet, there was a lot of great stuff that led up to it. On defense, it was a lot of the same thing. You had these great sacks and these big plays, and there was actually a decent amount, five sacks, forced fumble, fumble recovery. There's actually a decent amount of good plays in this game. It was just you followed it up immediately. by like You get like a 12-yard sack, and then you give up a 20-yard play. And it was that over and over. And then the same situations, when they did get Tampa down in the red zone or where they got them in third and longs, it was this big explosive play, and it just counterfeit everything that they did in a positive sense. So a lot of things obviously to go over there, but you hit on a ton of amazing things. And I was just trying to keep track of all of them as I was going through them because there's so much that I wanted to hit on. Yeah. When, when an offense comes out the gate, moves the ball, puts up points, you know, a lot of times, not in absolutes, but a lot of times that speaks to the defensive game plan you had in place. You didn't, you know, best prepare for how you thought that they were going to attack you. When that happens in the second half, in the third quarter, they're moving the ball, they're putting up points. It's a lack of adjustments. When over the course of the season, like we talked about, you're not seeing growth. That's a lack of development. All of that circles back to the coaching. It does. So let me follow that up by asking you the same thing. I kind of asked Justice yesterday, but are you surprised that Green Bay did not make a change at defensive coordinator on Monday? And the bigger question is, do you still think Joe Barry can keep his job? I'm not surprised at all. Like if if we were placing bets Sunday night, I would have bet that he's going to be here. I think part of it has to do with the small sample size that the or just not sample size, but that there's just three games left in the season. I do think whether or not this should be a part of the equation, because you can argue very easily like, hey, the, he's in charge. He's not getting the job done. You, you just got to move on. But I do think a part of the equation is I don't know. I don't know who you hire or not who you hire, but who you replace him with that's on your coaching staff. Wrote an article after the game just about a lot of things that we just discussed, and that was one of the things I put. Like, I wouldn't even have a guess in terms of who, like, from that defensive staff that Matt LaFleur would would put in place and put in charge and be the play caller. I also do wonder as well is if, because technically still in the playoff race, if you're just trying to hunker down, hold tight, and you don't want to have that big change you know, and the potential ripple effect where, you know, who knows which way that goes with the team and not knowing who would step in and be your defensive play caller. If you're just going to try to hang tight, see if you can pull off some wins in the final part of the season. And then just the, the history, the last three years, like there's been nothing to suggest that, you know, Matt LaFleur is going to make that in season uh, move. You know, the Eagles last season, what they rush for like 300 yards uh, against green Bay. And I think it was after that game when LaFleur was asked like, so are you going to make any changes? And he like was like, what, what? Why, am I, why are you asking me this right now? You know what I mean? So there's been like little evidence along the way that this is even part of the thought process. And even up until the last few weeks, like when he's questioned about, hey, it's been four 200-yard games this season, like it's going back on the players, missed assignments, missed gaps. Like, so again, you, you add all that together for me. And no, I, I, I didn't think that it was going to happen at this time. Now I do think it's going to happen in, in January. Once the season's over, you know, the, these guys are obviously 
connected at the hip. Matt LaFleur, this is his system that he wanted. Like, that's the thing about this. Matt LaFleur wanted this type of defense. He hired Joe Barry. That was his guy that he brought in. And the longer that this goes on, that he that this relationship goes, the more that negatively reflects on Matt LaFleur. Because again, at the end of the day, he's the man in charge. He's the, the you know, the CEO of the, the football operations in that regard of this team. So I think absolutely you have to move on from him in January. Yeah, I wasn't shocked either. The one thing that I did consider, you mentioned the three games left and still in the playoff race. I felt like maybe if they needed a spark, just something mm -hmm. different, like if there was any inkling that the players had grown super frustrated or just needed something different, I did wonder if they would maybe go in that direction for the last three games. The other question I have, and I don't know the answer to this one either, what if, what if Carolina just blast Green Bay this week. Like what if the worst off like worst team in football, worst offense, and they just put 400 yards and this defense quits. And I don't think that's going to happen to be crystal clear. Are you going to fire that dude on Christmas? Because like if like honestly, if if you if you can't stop Carolina this week and there are already the questions and this is the first time from Matt that I got the inkling of like it wasn't just uh, what what it wasn't the same right. as last year, right? Of like, what are you talking about? Yeah, it was or very he different. Knew, he understood. He he knew the question was coming. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think even after the first night, he's like, "Now's not the time." And I I didn't when he said, "Now's not the time," I didn't take it as "Now's not the time to hi fire the defensive coordinator." Right. I took it as "Now's not the time to talk about this." I need to go back and watch the mm -hmm. tape and gather myself and everything like that. It felt to me like there at least was contemplation from Sunday to Monday of what should happen. I'm just like, sincerely, if they go out and that defense just quits or cannot stop this offense, this Carolina offense, that that gets into a very tricky situation with it. It's just two weeks left. Um, I don't know what they do either. I don't know what, I don't know if it's Olivadati. I don't know if it's the the passing game quarter. I don't know what direction they would potentially go in. Um, but they've, they've left themselves very few outs if this week goes very poorly. I do expect it to end at the end of this season. I don't expect this weekend to go that poorly. Carolina's offense is just that bad. And then you follow it up with, who knows, Nick Mullins and the, the Minnesota Vikings and then the Bears the final week of the season. I'm almost more concerned that they actually put three good defensive games together than I am concerned about them putting three awful defensive performances together. But I, I don't know where they go from here. And I think that kind of leads us to our next point, and that was Devondre Campbell's very interesting tweet from Tuesday morning. I'll just read it out here. Not going out of my way anymore. And I'm not playing through injuries anymore because when bleep goes wrong, they always use it against you. I'm treating everyone accordingly and giving them the same energy they give me. Focus on yourself and your mental 59 talking to himself clearly here. You owe it to yourself. Now there's three interpretations in my opinion of this. And I, it's not fair to jump to any of the conclusions um, because we don't, we don't we obviously don't want to put words in Devondre's mouth. The three things is that he's frustrated the way that people talked, like in the media, online, talked about him on Monday following the game. He clearly had a very poor performance on Monday. I think it's probably also very clear, even though he was not on the injury report, that he's probably fighting through being hurt in some capacity. There's a difference between being cleared and being 100%. There's a difference between being injured and being hurt. There's probably something that is not quite 100% with Devondre. Now, that's probably with most players this time of year, but there's clearly something that's probably not 100% correct or right with him. And he goes out and he plays. He has not looked like himself the past two weeks. I would also argue he hasn't looked like himself the past two seasons, but that's maybe neither here nor there. And he clearly feels that he is getting, you know, it's a no-win situation where if you're Jair Alexander and you say, hey, I'm not coming back because I'm worried I can re-injure it, everyone hates the player then. If you come back early and you can't play at 100% and play like you're supposed to, everyone hates you then. So that's one interpretation. He's mad at the way he's covered the fans, all of that for being trashed on Monday for what was a very poor performance in the game on Sunday. Understandably so. I, un I understand it to some extent. There's a human element that goes into that. I can, if we're playing devil's advocate here and we think this is the avenue that it was, I can understand if you do everything in your power to rehab, to get back to play, to fight through injury, to play on Sunday. It doesn't quite go your way, but you knew you gave it your all and you gave everything you had to your team. It didn't go right. And then you're just trashed the next day. Um, that probably doesn't feel great. And if that's what it's about, okay, we can talk about that. 
The other is that he's upset with some sort of maybe position coaches or maybe the way that the floor handled the press conference and saying that it was on the players and the communication. He's upset with having to go in the game and then maybe getting his, you know, his feedback from the game from his coaches on Monday. Like there's a lot of different ways. Again, I don't want to, I don't want to read into this any more than it is. My belief is it's probably more the frustrations with the way that he was covered after the game, but what was your interpretation and thoughts on the overall tweet from Devondre? Yeah. So going back to the original point of where I talked about some of the reasons why, you know, LeFleur may have decided, all right, here's why we're just going to keep things status quo for these last three games. And I put this caveat in the article and I'll add it here as well. If there's any whiff inkling of, you know, the locker room losing faith in Barry. There's already a number of reasons why, you know, just from a pure football standpoint on the field, why, and we discussed them, why you would make the decision to move on. But if there is any sort of whiff inkling of the latter happening where there's, you know, they're losing faith, they're, you know, whatever terminology you want to use, you have to do it at that point, because then it yep. really starts to reflect on the head coach. And, like you laid it out perfectly in terms of what the reasons could be for that tweet. You know, obviously, none of us know. You now, tomorrow, the floor will speak. We'll see if Devondre Campbell's available. And maybe we'll get a little additional insight. But either way, it's probably probably not very good that he's no. that he's sending that out there. No, I agree. And and here's the thing. I to me, it's just it's it's bad optics in one way or the other. And maybe that doesn't matter all that much. Maybe that doesn't matter in the locker room. But it just, it's those things start to, to fester and that stuff starts to paint a, a poor picture of just kind of what's going on. And again, it's probably just the way that, you know, he was, you know, he was covered and he felt the way that he kind of just got dragged by everyone for the performance after, you know, coming back and playing the last couple of weeks uh, off of injury. But um, yeah, it just, it doesn't feel great. It doesn't look great. It doesn't, it, it is probably one of those tweets that might is, is, and we've all been there with sending an email or a text where you hit send and you're like, ah, that felt great. And then like 10 minutes later, you're like, oh, I was stupid. I never should have sent that. Um, I've certainly never had that experience on Twitter before. Uh, that would, that would be my first time, but uh, I'm sure it was probably something like that. And again, I respect the human element of this. We, we, I'm not expecting anyone to be perfect. And this is, if this is like the scandal, it's really not that big of a deal overall, unless he is calling out his coaches in which it becomes a much different deal very quickly, but it's tough to read into it too much. It just overall optics of it, obviously not good. All right, let's go through. I just kind of want to, um, you know, kind of lightning round some other things that happened in this game. Cause there were some other interesting things in this game, even though I think 99% of everyone's oxygen on the Packers this past week already has simply been about the state of the defense, Joe Barry and what they've done or not done in regards to that. But I wanted to start with Eric Stokes's return, your thoughts on uh, Eric's return and how he played in this game. Yeah. So, you know, I guess it was naive of me to think that going into the game, I didn't think he was going to start, but looking Same. back on it, the cornerback room is obviously in a much different position than it was in week seven in Denver. Jair is inactive. Razul Douglas is in Buffalo. Um, so again, I didn't expect that to happen, but saw him going through with the starters and warmups. He ended up playing 76% of the snaps. Matt LaFleur said that, you know, Stokes did a good job of communicating, you know, when, Needed a breather. Got to get back into football shape. It's been th over 13 months for him since he'd played, you know, those type of defensive snaps in a game. And he was he was available on Monday at his locker. And I mean, you could tell that he was just he was just excited to be back out there. And I can't even imagine the 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 journey that he's been on for the 13 months and the setbacks that he had because he had the hamstring injury reportedly during the summer that yep. um, stifled or gotten it was a hurdle for him coming back and the obvious one that landed him on IR. And he was just talking about the emotions coming out of the tunnel. And then, you know, like you hear about once you make that first tackle, that was when, all right, we're good to go. Things kind of started to settle in for him. But, and there was, uh, there was no easing in for Eric Stokes, as we just talked about, as we saw, he was, he was a starter at the cornerback position. He saw his share of Mike Evans and, you know, he was targeted four times, allowed four receptions at almost 17 yards per catch. So, I mean, everyone in that secondary, whether it's play or how they were positioned, whatever it may be, obviously took their lumps in that game. But, you know, tough matchup. First one back in 13 months to be out there on the field on and be asked to, all right, go out there and, and handle that type of, you know, handle Mike Evans, Chris Godwin. But obviously the positive, he came out through the game feeling well. And 
this is going to be a really, really important three games for him, just in terms of trying to get that trajectory, the arrow pointed up for 2024. I was asked it was a couple months, but I think it was before his return to Denver, like where does Eric Stokes like stand, you know, and I don't have an answer. Yeah. 2021, his rookie year, really good. Last year before the injury was struggled or did struggle. This year's been, obviously he hasn't played up until this point. Like it's kind of a big question mark on, you know, where he is and he's going to they have the fifth year option, but he's entering the final guaranteed year of his rookie deal in 2024. So hopefully uh, can string together some positive games over these final few weeks, get some momentum building up into 2024 and hit the ground run in the summer. Yeah, not a super great performance from Eric, but I don't care at all. Like mm-hmm. that, that I'm willing to give every ounce of forgiveness in his first game back in a 13 month absence going against Chris Godwin and Mike Evans. And I didn't think it was like, I know a lot of people looked on like, man, it did. It wasn't atrocious. It was, it was a, not a great performance, but it wasn't like anything brutal or egregious in my opinion. And it was just great seeing him back out there. And that's kind of, you know, I know they're still in the playoff race, whatever, like that's still what the remainder of the season is for is to still evaluate as much as they can in this season. They've got a lot of really positive evaluations already this year, but there's still some evaluations that need to be checked off. Um, the next one we'll talk about is one of that as well, but Eric Stokes is maybe the biggest one. Obviously, Jordan is still being evaluated on everything. He's passed a lot of the tests already, but that evaluation still continues. But I think maybe one of the biggest ones that's left that's just kind of this blaring question mark is Eric Stokes. And if you can go into 2024 expecting him to be a, just a part of your rotation, or if you're like, we, we have no idea, we might need to replace it, we need competition, whatever, I think these last three games are going to be really important. My bigger takeaway, just great to see him out there. And then again, that other one is we're continuing to see this offensive line rotation. Um, I tweeted out today in the past five weeks, and I know PFF has had something similar out there. To me, Rashid Walker has looked like a starting offensive tackle. It has been a night and day difference between those first nine games of the season and the past five. It was something like a negative four point something grade over the first nine and a plus one point something grade over the last five. He's just looked really freaking good. And that to me, that rotation is probably good to stop, specifically when you add in the fact that Rashid is under contract two more years and Yash isn't under contract for any more years. That just seems to be like a blare. And Yash hasn't come close to playing at the level that Rashid has really even at any point this season, in my opinion. So that one feels like it needs to stop. But the other one is getting more interesting. I will say I thought John Runyon Jr. actually had one of his better games of the season this year. But we also saw Sean Ryan for the first time, take about half the snaps away from John Runyon Jr. Your thoughts on that rotation continuing? Yeah, it was a few weeks ago and Stenovich was asked about it and he said that they were going to continue to do it. Like him and the floor have loved this, the the competition that's been added to left tackle and right guard. And they felt that it's, and I think we've seen it as well, the collective unit, but the play of this group is elevated since they've started yeah. doing this, maybe putting, you know, uh, everyone minus Elton Jenkins and Zach Tom on notice a little bit. But, you know, he also added when talking about that, that they're going to continue to do it until someone really stood out above the rest. And to your point, you know, while Rashid Walker's snaps in compared to Nyman's have increased, like it went from 50, 50 to about three quarters to a quarter, you know, I feel like we've seen enough there to go, all right, here's your guy moving forward. And then everything you just mentioned as well, from a contract standpoint, you know, two years left on his rookie deal, a free agent, like all the signs point to Walker getting those snaps at, at right guard. And obviously the rotation has been going on there since week nine, but the noticeable aspect that you mentioned is that it was about 50, 50 this week, whereas previously it had been, you know, a series, maybe two series for, uh, Sean Ryan out there. And I had the opportunity to talk to him last week and one just asked him, all right, you're one to year two, like, where's the, where's the biggest difference in your game? And a lot of it goes back to, you know, the things we hear about just the comfortability with the playbook and his role. You know, Aaron Rodgers talked about that all the time. There's the playbook on paper, and then there's the ability to go out there and actually execute on the field when the defense is throwing different things at you. And then there's the understanding of not only what you're doing or how to react to what the defense is doing, but what the guys around you are doing as well. And that ability, just that understanding can help elevate your game. And that's what a lot of the progress that he's seen, he has he has chalked it up to. I also asked him, I said, How's that rotation for you as an offense alignment? You know, and that's the thing with Ryan, like at least with 
uh, at left tackle, there's there's a cadence like it was every other series. And now it's Walker gets two, Nyman gets one Walker, you know. But for Ryan, it didn't seem like there's been any real rhyme or reason to when he's been asked to go in the game. And he right. said, you know, that has been challenging just to get that couple couple minutes notice. And then all of a sudden you're like, all right, I'm out there on the field. But he did add this as well. He thinks that for the offensive line as a whole, does provide them with a little bit of an advantage because just like an offensive lineman can get used to how a defender is going to rush them, the defender gets used to what the offensive lineman does and getting that bit of a change up and, you know, going from Runyon to Ryan, you know, he said that collectively he does think that that's provided the the Packers offensive line a little bit of a boost. I do wonder if, you know, obviously we'll find out in the Carolina game if this is where things are trending or if this was just, hey, we think matchup wise, because, you know, yeah, they got Vita Vea in the middle. Sean Ryan has been a more physical yeah. type of player, someone more stout who maybe they felt could hold up better at the point of attack against a player like Vea in the middle. So we'll find out on Sunday if it's been more of a it was that was more matchup based or if the pendulum is actually swinging more in Ryan's direction. No, I think that's going to be interesting as well. I'd like to see a game where maybe it's just Ryan 75-25 at least, just to kind of get a little bit more of a feel for what that looks like for a longer period of time. But um, to your point, it's been working. And while I still would go with just Rashid and continue the rotation at the other spot, um, if it's working, maybe just don't break it all that much and maybe keep that competition going and maybe keep everyone on their toes and see what that brings you the rest of the season. Uh, all right, a couple other quick ones. Thoughts on Wicks, Reed, Craft? They continue to remain a pretty significant bright spot for this team on offense. Yeah, I mean, at the beginning of this, we just talked about the lack of growth on the defensive side of the ball, but Rasheed Walker, Jordan Love, uh, this trio of rookie pass catchers, I mean, this continue to impress. Uh, Wicks, Craft, Reed, I believe, had 206 of Jordan Love's 284 yards coming up in the red zone with some touchdown grabs from Kraft and Reed. Uh, third down plays, I believe, on that touchdown drive in the second half that got him to 17. I think Wes Hodquitz tweeted it out. They had like 61 yards on third down between three catches between Reed and Wicks. Like, just absurd. The, those guys' ability to create chunk plays, to just the feel that they have to find the soft spot in defenses has been incredibly impressive. And even as discouraging overall with the losses that have happened these last two weeks, the way we talked about it last week, how the offense finished on those final three drives against the Giants, despite how poorly everything had gone. And then the the continued progress from Kraft, Reed, and Wicks in this game as well. Jordan Love, Jordan Love as well, coming up, being able to, you know, move the ball in those situations. So uh, hard not to be excited about what this this Packers receiver room, tight end room looks like. Like the development that Kraft's had right now, like they hadn't had that combination with Luke Musgrave on the field. Like that's going to be incredibly exciting to see how, how Matt LaFleur uses those two going forward. Could not agree more. I, I'm getting absurdly excited about Tucker Craft, and it's not necessarily even from just a production standpoint, not even just from a blocking standpoint. It's from an attitude standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, he's having fun out there just hitting people. Uh, every great tight end has a little bit of the right crazy in them, and it seems like Tucker Craft has that. I, I am really enjoying watching the way that he plays football. His growth from the beginning of the year until now has been pretty dang exponential. And I'm really excited to see where that ends up. And the other reason that I'm so excited about him of kind of everyone, it's it's not easy, but teams know how to find good wide receivers. There's a, there's a good chunk of good wide receivers in the league. Like if we're looking at even like Reed and Wicks and those guys are playing really good football right now, but there's a lot of Reed Wickses and guys that are at or around that caliber or better in the NFL. Good tight ends are very difficult to find. And when you can find one that can block and can catch and can run after the catch and can find ways to separate, man, those things are gold. And I am not saying in any way, shape or form that Tucker Craft is a finished product. He still has a long way to go to get to that point of being an upper echelon tight end but I've seen a lot of stuff that makes me super encouraged of what he could become. I think sooner rather than later, maybe in the next year or two. And if any of that comes to fruition and you mentioned it as well, the potential tag team with Musgrave. And then now you add in on top of that, the Watsons, the Wicks, the Dobbs, the, like all of it, whew, man, that there's a lot of reason for optimism just with that, that tight end and, and wide receiver group alone. Obviously, the position coaches don't get a lot of the, the spotlight 
but I've been incredibly impressed and wasn't, you know, I'm not going to pretend like I was super familiar with him before this year, but John Dunn, the tight ends coach, one, the growth progress that we've seen from Musgrave prior to his injury, Tucker Craft this season at what Matt LaFleur called the second most difficult position to transition to from college to the NFL after quarterback. And there's been some, I, the Christian Watson touchdown catch that I know everyone where Matt LaFleur gave John Dunn the credit afterwards, but there was another play earlier in the season too. And I apologize, but I can't remember which one, but it was again, John Dunn who drew that up on the fly, like his contribution to the tight end room, obviously, but just what he's, you know, and those are only the stories that we hear about, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I, but he's someone, one of those position coaches that obviously none of them get a ton of attention, but he's someone this season to me, that's really, really stood out. Not, not only just the plays and stuff like that, he has, there's only three players in his room. DeGuara has been spending, as you know, a lot of time in that H back fullback mm -hmm. sort of role. And I'm sure Dunn has some oversight. He has three rookies. And as you mentioned, this the second toughest position outside of quarterback to transition from college to the NFL. I have all three of them graded in the positive this year. That is absurd. When you, cause I can't even tell you just in like the years of doing this, how many tight ends just are going to end up in the negative just based on their blocking alone? Like it's, it almost doesn't matter like what they do as a pass catcher, just because their blocking was just going to get them in the negative more often than it was going to get them in the positive. The fact that he has three rookies and all that they asked them to do in this offense and all three are graded in the positive through this. It's unbelievable. It's and one of them's an undrafted waiver claim, by the way. It's, it's one thing if maybe the second and third round pick are doing it. It's another when you're undrafted guy who would have had an explosive play this week too. Had Jordan Love maybe just had that one throw a little bit more on target. Paul, we had so many other things on our agenda, but we like uh, there's just been so much to cover with this team, and obviously we spent a ton of time on defense. Anything else that uh, you want to get off your chest before we get out of here? Otherwise, feel free to plug anything you want as well. No, we we hit all the big stuff, Andy. Appreciate you as always. Follow me on Twitter at Paul underscore Brett. I'll find all my work over at Packers Wire. And then hit like, hit subscribe on YouTube. Channel name is Paul Brettel. Make sure to give him a follow on X at Paul underscore Brettel and check out his YouTube page as well. Can't miss stuff. It's always awesome every single week. Of course, you can follow me at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Packaday Podcast. That's going to do it for us today, but until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go!